Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest virtual installment of the B'nai B'rith Diplomatic Encounter Series. I'm Dan Mary Ashen, CEO of B'nai B'rith International. We're very fortunate to be joined today by our friend and ambassador of Portugal to the United States, His Excellency Domingos Bejas Vital. The history of Jewish life in Portugal dates to the Roman Empire, but it was the Moorish invasion of 711 that brought about what is highly regarded as the golden age of Jewish culture in the Iberian Peninsula. It was within this period that Jews began to prosper and gain high regard in Portuguese society. The Spanish Inquisition in 1492 brought an influx of 60,000 Jewish refugees into Portugal until the plague of expulsion made its way to Portugal four years later. The country the country's connection to the Jews was greatly strengthened during World War II when Portugal, Portugal claimed neutrality and became a safe haven and transit point for thousands of Jewish refugees fleeing Central Europe. Today, Portugal's Jewish population sits somewhere around 3,000 self-identified Jews, though it is estimated that as many as 20% of the general population of Portugal has, in fact, Jewish ancestry. Mm -hmm. In 2019, the International Council of B'nai B'rith met in Lisbon with an agenda that included a number of fascinating insights into Portuguese and Jewish history. Our delegation heard from leaders of the Jewish communities of Lisbon and Porto and learned about the heroic legacy of Portuguese diplomat Aristides de Souza Mendes, who issued visas to refugees, including thousands of Jews, fleeing Nazi terror during World War II. We also had the great pleasure of hearing from Katerina Vajpinto, culture counselor on the Lisbon City Council, who served as a key player in the launch of the Jewish Museum of Lisbon and has proven a true broker of Portuguese Jewish relations, as well as His Excellency Rafael Gamzu, ambassador of Israel to Portugal. Portugal formally recognized the state of Israel in 1977 following the Portuguese revolution, Bilateral relations have ebbed and flowed over the years, but in the year 2000, the Israel-Portugal Chamber of Commerce was created to spark tourism, wine trade, and cultural exchanges among the two countries. Under a law passed in 2013 and enacted in 2015, descendants of Sephardic Jews may now acquire Portuguese citizenship. The naturalization law was seen by many as a form of making amends for the persecution of Jews during the Inquisition and comes amid a host of initiatives by the Portuguese government to strengthen the country's ties to Jewish audiences and to recognize its Jewish heritage. Since 2015, there have been more than 76,000 applications for Portuguese naturalization with approximately one third of applicants granted citizenship. And last year, B'nai B'rith established a branch of our organization in Oporto. B'nai follows Portugal's role on the world stage with great interest. In December 2020, Portuguese Foreign Minister uh, Santos Silva traveled to Jerusalem for bilateral meetings just prior to the country's assumption of the presidency of the Council of the European Union in the first half of this year. Portugal has outlined an ambitious agenda dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and its social and economic consequences and we're eager to hear more today about Portuguese priorities for its EU Council presidency through the end of June and beyond, and in particular, Portugal's bilateral relations with Israel and with the United States. And so it is with great pleasure that I now introduce His Excellency Domingos Fejas Vital, Ambassador of Portugal to the United States. Ambassador Fejas Vital has dutifully served the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1983. Prior to assuming his current role at the beginning of 2016, he served as permanent representative of Portugal to the European Union. He's held diplomatic posts in locations around the world, including the Portuguese mission to NATO. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome Ambassador Fejas Vital here today. Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you so much, Dan. It's very good to see you, even if it's not uh, in person. I hope that uh, that will be possible very soon in, in the future. But uh, let me start by thanking you very much and, uh, and B'nai B'rit for 
for this invitation. I'm very honored and very pleased to be here with you and to welcome all those who decided to take some of their precious time to spend this moment uh, with us. I'm very, very honored. Well, I don't know if we have anyone watching from, from Israel, but if that's, uh, if that's the case, uh, shalom, shalom. And I would like to congratulate you all on the uh, Yom Atzmaut just last week. And I hope that with the uh, successful rollout of the vaccination in, in Israel, that it was possible for you to celebrate in person without masks uh, in your barbecues with your families, um, uh, celebrating as, as uh, you should uh, Israel's National Day. This is also for me an opportunity to pay tribute to the outstanding uh, work that's been carried out by B'nai Brit uh, since, since its inception in uh, so many fields, uh, in the social, culture, education, philanthropic fields. And so um, once again, I'm uh, extremely honored and pleased uh, to be with you. And uh, I have to tell you that I'm very curious about your questions as well. There was uh, an American president that I admire a lot, who was Roosevelt, who used to say, you don't learn much while you're speaking. And so <laughs> I hope that I will be able to learn something from you as well over this uh, conversation. But thank you very, very much once again. Well, Mr. Ambassador, why don't we start uh, really uh, with Portugal being at the helm of the European Council now for a few months. How would you describe the success of the Portuguese presidency thus far? And what on your agenda remains to be realized in the, in the two and a half months to go? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot, <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, well, this is not the first time we are uh, at the helm of the, of the European Union. This is our fourth presidency. Uh, the, third, the three uh, past presidencies have been quite successful. Uh, by the way, the treaty that governs the European Union is called Lisbon Treaty. The uh, development strategy uh, of the European Union till 2020 was called Lisbon Strategy. And even the euro, the European single currency, was set up during a Portuguese presidency. Uh, so the treaty was called Maastricht Treaty because it was signed in Maastricht, but the agreement was reached under a Portuguese presidency. So I would say that the bar is quite high, the expectations are quite high, justifiably so, uh, and the uh, circumstances, the present circumstances that do not make our task easier with all the constraints imposed by the, uh, by the, um, by the pandemic. But talking about the presidency itself, uh, there's something that comes to my mind. I had a teacher at the university whom I liked a lot, who used to start all his classes, no matter the issue at stake, by saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first, a little bit of context. And uh, we, we, I found out, well, we became friends, I, and I found out that we were both big fans of a, a Spanish philosopher called Ortega Gasset, who used to say that I am me and my circumstance. And I think that this applies to the presidencies as well. So what is the me? What is the permanent element of any presidency? Well, it's a very, very uh, demanding exercise, logistically speaking and politically speaking. Why? Logistically, well, I'm talking about uh, around 2,000 2, meetings chaired by the Portuguese presidency. So it, just imagine, uh, under the present circumstances, organizing and making sure that we get all these meetings and we get everybody. And this is the second part of the exercise that makes it so challenging uh, that we manage to get the consensus around the table uh, among 27 member states, sometimes with very disparate views on the issues uh, we, we are dealing with. So this is the, the, the element of permanence in, in a presidency. 2,000 meetings and the need to reach a compromise among 27 uh, member states. But 
um, talking about the priorities themselves, well, um, I think that um, the priorities are uh, a response to the circumstances. So what we do, what we do is to bring a response or try and bring a response to the, uh, uh, to the circumstances of the moment. As far as we are concerned, I would say that we have the most immediate challenges. And the two most immediate challenges are of course the pandemic, and so the rollout of the vaccination. And the second one is the economic recovery in Europe. And I would say that the two go together. It's not possible to have a credible and sustained, sustainable economic recovery in the, in the European Union without having fought and beaten the pandemic. One thing goes, goes with the other. Then I, I would say the uh, medium term medium-term uh, uh, challenges. And these are the digital transition, the green transition, and the social impact of both transitions. Because we are, of course, fully aware of the fact that uh, these transitions imply a new sort of paradigm, you know, and pattern uh, of development. Of course, they will have some social costs. And we have to make sure that no one is left behind. Otherwise, we'll have people against these sort of transitions and making them even more difficult than they already are. And so I would say that these are uh, the challenges of, of a more uh, medium term uh, nature. And last but not least, of course, you have the external dimension of our presidency. And here, I would say that the most relevant priority the most immediate priority is the strengthening of the transatlantic link, of the transatlantic bond. Asking about results, well, uh, we had a lot, but just yesterday, there was a, what I would say is, is a, a landmark. It's something, a uh, big, big achievement for the European Union, and I dare to say for the fight, for the global fight against climate change. The European Union, uh, approved, it was negotiated by the Portuguese presidency and the European Parliament, uh, and they reached an agreement on a new climate law that will enable the European Union to be the first neutral, carbon neutral continent in the world by 2050. So uh, that was uh, a big, big achievement, and we are very, very proud of the role we were able to play as, as presidency of the European Union in reaching it. I don't know whether- Just to follow, just to follow up, thank you. Just to follow up on, on COVID-19, <clears throat> because uh, of course, every country has its own public health policy. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, you have the European Union. So how, where is the nexus? And, and I know that there have been particular problems in, in, in some European countries, lesser in others. Where is the nexus on public health between the individual um, sovereign state policies and policy of the EU? Yeah, your question is very, very good, Dan, for, for many reasons. Uh, I would say that uh, we now have what we call common policies. And so these are policies that are European Union's policies where our, our member states have ceded that sovereignty fully. So it's up to the European Union to speak for us. Okay. When we talk, for instance, about trade, that's the European Union that negotiates trade agreements with other countries on behalf of us all, you know. But as you say, health is not a common policy, is not a common policy. But the history of the European Union, of the building up of the European Union is very much a history of uh, a process uh, that, that was built crisis by crisis, I would say, you know? So after each crisis, uh, you have to respond to that crisis and you realize that the best way for you to respond to that crisis is by doing it together with the other European member, member states. And so 
you realize that you need, you need a common something, you know, to be um, better prepared to, to, to deal with the, with, the issue, uh, uh, with the issue at stake. Uh, so I would say that the pandemic is teaching us a lesson, which is that we need at least something common in the health, in the health sector as well, to be able to fight effectively, not, one, not only this one, but future pandemics, future pandemics. And so having realized that, what you have now, I would say, is the very first step on the way to something that nobody knows exactly which, uh, which sort of thing we will have at the end of, of the day. But uh, I would say that this is a, a first step. And so we decided, all of us, that it would be better for the European Union, for, for us as a single European member states, to get together um, and to act together as far as the procurement and the distribution of the vaccines was concerned. This allowed for two things that were essential, essential. That prevented us from fighting against us for the vaccines and that enable us as a group to get much better conditions in negotiating the prices with the pharmaceuticals. Because we were talking not about the uh, number of vaccines I would need for Portugal or for France, even for a bigger member state, but for 500 million people. So, of course, the, uh, the conditions were much better, as, as you might imagine. So, uh, coming to your point, I think that uh, what we have now, so this common approach, European common approach to procurement and distribution, uh, is, is the result of acknowledging the advantages of working together, but I do not exclude that this was only the first step on the way to something that would uh, resemble, I would say, uh, very much a common policy of the European Union in the medium and long term. Well, with the uh, 2015 naturalization law, yes, uh, in effect, uh, paired uh, with the opening of Portugal's first Holocaust museum, the Holocaust Museum of Porto on January 20th, which is a really a, a magnificent uh, new institution telling the story of uh, the Holocaust. Uh, Portuguese Jewish relations uh, certainly seem uh, really to be in a, in a trajectory. So the question really is how can one use education and modern tools of communication uh, to further promote mutual understanding between Portugal and, and the Jewish community, not only Jewish community in, in Portugal, but uh, worldwide. And what lessons for Europe can Portuguese relations uh, teach us? And what are your hopes for the future? Mm -hmm. Dan, uh, first of all, let me tell you that uh, we'll have a second museum uh, in 2022 in Lisbon. It will be called Museum of Memory. Uh, and so it will be dedicated to the Holocaust, to the Jewish memory in Portugal. And uh, we are very excited about that. And we hope that we'll be able for you and our friends who are watching us to uh, be in Lisbon and join us in celebrating that, uh, that big event. Uh, so, but that will happen in 2022. Um, at the same time, Portugal became, as you know, a full member of the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in uh, 2019. Just recently and within the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union, we've just held a conference, an international conference um, on, the, um, on the protection against racial discrimination and intolerance, including anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, and answering your question, we have a national program in Portugal called Never Forget, Never Forget. 
and it's dedicated to the uh, memory of the Holocaust and the lessons learned from from that uh, from the horrors of the of the Holocaust. It's based on four pillars: knowledge, education, institutional memory, and promotion. And um, it's a program that involves our education system, schools, universities, you name it. So when you talk about uh, teaching people about lessons of the past, uh, I would say that this is a very, very important, uh, a very important tool that we have in Portugal to, to do just that. You mentioned uh, just in the beginning of our conversation, Aristides Sousa Mendes, and I, I would like to tell uh, all those who are watching, who are with us today, uh, that um, uh, we hope it will be possible to uh, approve uh, very soon in the Senate in the United States a resolution that's been tabled, and I thank them wholeheartedly for that, by Senators, Senators Toomey and Murphy, honoring uh, the memory of Aristides uh, Sousa Mendes. So uh, I think it will be another reason for us to, to celebrate uh, uh, together. Well, so on the, the naturalization law, where do things stand today? We know that already you know, thousands have applied. Many have received a citizenship. What is the status of, of the law today? Well, the law, uh, we... Um, we had a, a revision pros, process of, of the, the nationality law in Portugal recently. And so, um, of course, this being part of our nationality, it was also under review, you know, but it was decided to change lots of things in our nationality law, but not to touch that chapter. So the law remains as it was before the revision of our nationality law. Uh, and so it's still there. And um, uh, we don't have any, any deadlines, unlike some other nationality uh, uh, laws or, or, or uh, some other um, similar procedures, you know, in other countries that had a deadline. In our case, it doesn't. It does not. Okay. So uh, the nationality remains, nationality, as far as the uh, uh, concession of Portuguese nationality. Uh, to uh, Sephardic Jews uh, remains very much as, as it was before the revision of the nationality law. And as you say, well, we have thousands and thousands of people applying. And I think that this is having an impact on the level of investment in Portugal, you know, coming from Israel. That's increasing significantly lately, you know. Um, uh, I have a nephew who works for uh, a company uh, coming from, from Israel. And, and you have lots, lots of, of investment, Israeli investment these days in Portugal. And one of the very, very interesting results of the visit of our, my minister to Israel, you mentioned that in the beginning. Uh, and by the way, it was the third visit of my minister to, uh, to Israel. And, uh, and uh, we've just appointed as our ambassador to Israel, one of our top diplomats. It was our ambassador to Brazil before going to Israel. So this tells you a lot uh, about the importance that we attach to the potential of the uh, relationship between Portugal and the United States. But these visits allow for uh, identifying lots of fields for future cooperation between Portugal and, and, uh, and Israel. Uh, well, you mentioned Israel and Portugal on the, on the bilateral level, but let me ask about an, an EU-related uh, question. At, at a digital conference held by the Portugal-Israel Chamber of Commerce and the Israeli mission to the European Union in January, mm -hmm. uh, Israeli ambassador to Portugal, Rafi Gamzu, called for the resumption of the dormant EU-Israel Association Council uh, during uh, the six-month Portuguese EU presidency. Uh, the council, uh, which last met in 2012, uh, regulates, as you know, regulates and <clears throat> advances Israeli-EU ties under the legal framework of the EU-Israel Association Agreement, which is 
governed the relationship between the EU itself and Israel since the year 2000. Uh, Ambassador Gamzu's remarks uh, at that time uh, echoed uh, the sentiment shared by uh, Foreign Minister uh, Augusto uh, Santos Silva uh, during his last visit to, to Israel in, in December. What can we expect to see in the remaining months uh, of the Portuguese presidency on this front in terms of the association agreement? And what opportunities can this multilateral forum, do you think, uh, provide uh, to further strengthen cooperation between the EU and the state of Israel? I have no answer for you, I'm afraid, Dan. Frankly speaking, um, I think that uh, this is under consideration, as you know, but I'm not updated on that, on that uh, particular, particular issue. So um, there, there, there was uh, another, another American president who used to say that if you don't have anything new to say, don't say anything. So at this stage, I'm afraid that I cannot be very, very helpful. Well, that, that's an answer, but we, we do hope, uh, and it's not, just a, it's not just the Portuguese presidency issue. I mean, this council is, has been dormant for the last eight years. Uh, so much can be done. You mentioned uh, trade, investment. Uh, and there are other spinoffs that relate to tourism. This is a, a, a big European issue, not only the bilateral issue. And of course, I think that Israel is, uh, that Europe is still Israel's largest trading partner. So this is really uh, an important uh, question, an important issue that, that we believe really needs uh, to be moved along. Mm -hmm. If I can, let me revisit again the IRA, um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance issue uh, for just a moment. Uh, you, you did mention that uh, Portugal is a member of IRA. Uh, became a full member in December of 2019, and we're very pleased about that. Uh, last month, as recently as last month, uh, legislators in Portugal discussed the possible adoption of the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism. And uh, that's, that's an extremely important step because now we begin to see there is movement, there's some momentum Many countries now are considering it. Here in the United States, many states are adopting this. NGOs, uh, even uh, in Europe, uh, the Football Association, the Argentine Football Association. This is really now beginning uh, to spread. So when do you think we could expect to see Portugal adopt the working definition? And um, more importantly, uh, what can we do um, to encourage, as, as I remember, what can we do to encourage uh, more member states uh, to adopt uh, that working definition. It's extremely important. Let me just add, uh, for those who are viewing, this definition creates a, a baseline definition of what anti-Semitism is. You know, for, for all these years, we never really had a definition. And this really is a, it, it's a baseline, but it really, at the same time, is very detailed in terms of what constitutes anti-Semitism. So be interested in your comments on that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for the question. As you said, well, the point um, was discussed in our parliament, which shows you that there is an ongoing reflection in Portugal about the issue. Uh, I cannot give you uh, a deadline. It's not possible for me to tell you, well, you can expect something to be decided by, you know. But just the fact that among all this um, pressure that we are uh, having uh, rising from the pandemic situation, the economic recovery, that our parliament decided to have a discussion on that shows you that uh, the importance that we attach to the issue. And I think that this is very relevant already. In the meantime, in the meantime, let me tell you that our legal system in Portugal, including the constitution, already gives all possible guarantees and assurances uh, as far as uh, any anti-Semitic behavior is concerned in Portugal. It's a crime. It's a crime, according to the constitution, according to the law, to the law in Portugal. And so people can be prosecuted for that in Portugal, condemned and go to jail for that. So uh, it's already there. And I would say that this is not only, you know, a legal 
a legal uh, point. Um, we have this sort of, uh, of rules applying in Portugal because they translate um, a general feeling in the Portuguese population, I would say, who sees that anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism um, in general as abject, something abject. And so uh, I would say that what we have in law is not only the fruit of uh, a legal concern, do you know, but translates the deep feelings of the Portuguese people. And this is why, and this is why, as acknowledged by all international reports and assessments, and, and like in other places, unfortunately, you have so very few anti-Semitic incidents in Portugal. Very, very, very few. So uh, I would say that this is not only because the, the law says what it, what it says, that's because of the feelings of the population. You know that uh, if anyone dares to, uh, to adopt such a behavior in Portugal, the uproar would be immediate and the reaction from the public opinion would be immediate. So uh, I, I think that this is, this is very important. I see your point, of course, about the definition. As you know, um, you've already made that point several times, and I thank you for that. And I would say that if you want other countries and other organizations to, uh, well, to adopt the definition, you just have to do what you've been doing with us, with Portugal, for a long time. You know, uh, that's an ongoing discussion. But in the meantime, for everybody watching us, please be absolutely reassured you already have in Portugal all possible legal guarantees that would uh, make sure that anyone that would even dare, you know, to to uh, to adopt such a such a, a behavior uh, would be uh, prosecuted or just not accepted. And it's not only a legal issue; it's the attitude of the Portuguese people. Yeah, it's, no, it's it's a legal issue, and you have to have that that those legal um, enforcements in place um, to go along with the, with the moral issue. But there is one, one issue I'd like to, and we raise this, next is the question I'm gonna uh, offer to you here. Um, we ask of other countries as well, government and civil society really require adequate, adequate data uh, to tackle uh, hatred uh, towards Jews that is so pervasive now uh, in many parts of Europe. But as the European Union's Agency for Fundamental Rights uh, latest anti-Semitism overview reveals, there are still large gaps in collecting data about the, the, when people commit these crimes. Uh, and this annual overview notes that, that no official data uh, pertaining to anti-Semitism uh, is available in Portugal. So the question is, uh, what can be done? And I guess here we're making an appeal and again, not only to Portugal, but uh, to all countries. It's not e even only particular to Europe. I mean, I would say this globally, mm -hmm. that in order to understand trends, to order, in order to understand uh, flashpoints, uh, in order to better understand uh, the nature of anti-Semitic crimes, because anti-Semitism, you know, it comes from the left, it comes from the right, it comes from, from extremists uh, across the, the board. Um, the, 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 the appeal to you is, or the question together with it is, how do you think Portugal can deal with this issue of collecting this data? Because really it's extremely important. Yeah, Dan, I thank you for, for the question and I take your appeal. I think it's, uh, it's very important and you can be sure that I will convey it to my people back home. But um, if, if you don't mind, well, uh, you have, two very lively, dynamic Jewish uh, communities in, in Portugal, in Lisbon and Oporto, you know? And I have many friends uh, working there as well. Um, I think that will be very important to work with them, you know? Not only making sure that they do that, they, they have their own registry of, of uh, any possible incidents, but that they work with the Portuguese authorities 
in making sure that this information reaches uh, all those concerned, you know, in the uh, in the Portuguese in the Portuguese government. Uh, I see a role for them on, on that. You see, uh, so you know them well. Uh, I think, frankly speaking, that this could be one. Uh, I don't want to sound, you know, to uh, uh, teaching lessons. To, you know, it's not it's not what I, I'm I'm supposed to be to be doing. But I think there is a very important role for them uh, as far as this uh, uh, data collection is concerned. You know, and in working with the uh, Portuguese authorities in making sure that um, that this information uh, reaches all those who need to know, who need to know, not only uh, to act, but to inform, to inform. You're just talking about uh, a European Union's report. Well, to be able to inform, you know, uh, when asked. So there's nothing dramatic about that, you know? So it's, uh, I think it's to advantage of everybody. I have a question uh, relating to uh, terrorism. Uh, the, the U.S., the United Kingdom, uh, Germany, um, the, uh, is Israel, of course, are among a growing number of countries that recognize Hezbollah in its entirety as a terrorist organization. By contrast, I think you know this, the European Union has thus far only designated Hezbollah's military wing as a terrorist organization. And in practice, you know, Hezbollah's military and political wings work in tandem. There is no, there is no really distinction. Hezbollah itself doesn't make any distinction. Uh, and in any case, all money is fungible. So this is a, a terrorist organization. Um, Portugal has yet to, to designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Um, we believe that this is really an important step in the international war on terror and in sending a signal. Now. Um, Admittedly, you know, where all of this started, you, you recall there was a terrorist incident in Borgas in, in Bulgaria. It was determined that Hezbollah was involved in it. Uh, the Bulgarians brought to the EU the question of designating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. And then we came up with this bifurcated definition um, or, or recognition. Um, and then only in the last year, a number of countries now, because it's clear exactly what Hezbollah is, is up to. Uh, are beginning to designate uh, Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. You know, our, our, um, our request really is that Portugal do this. And um, I would hope uh, that uh, you could join in this growing number of countries. And the importance here is because it, it sends a signal, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, to Hezbollah, but not only to Hezbollah. Uh, international terror, it's alive and well in so many places uh, mm -hmm. on the European continent and and, and Middle East, but in many other places, of course. So uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that and, and how we, we could move forward on that particular issue. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, I couldn't be, uh, agree more with you on the, uh, on the importance of fighting uh, terrorism uh, uh, in an efficient manner. Portuguese is a member of the coalition against uh, ISIS. Uh, we now have a training mission in Mozambique to help uh, the Mozambicans to to deal with the uh, problems that they are they are facing in the north of the country. So uh, we are on the ground fighting terrorism on the ground. Our people uh, is putting their lives at stake in fighting our soldiers uh, in fighting against against terrorism in several theaters all over the world. So we couldn't agree more with the importance of uh, of being effective. In, in the in the fight against against terrorism, on the particular issue you raised, uh, I see your point. Uh, we know about your views, but let me be very candid with you. As a member of the European Union, Portugal believes that when something like this is to be decided, it is to the advantage of everybody concerned that we have a single voice, a single position of the European Union. And before we have it, we prefer not to take any public standing on anything. So not to uh, 
public stance. I, I, I would say um, there is, as you know, a discussion going on. We are part to that discussion, but we are not making this discussion public. And um, you have different views around the table, as you know. Otherwise, we will have, have, have a, a, a common European Union's position on the issue. That's because uh, we have, I have candidly to, to, um, to assume, well, we are split on, on the issue. You have people telling you no, people telling you yes, people telling you tomorrow, people telling you only if, uh, things like that. But we believe that these are internal discussions and as a member of the European Union, we should always favor a common European Union position. And we don't want to take any public stance that would harm, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that uh, final objective. So I take your point, but it's an ongoing discussion. <laughs> Well, Mr. Ambassador, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, really, I uh, appreciate uh, this uh, discussion, this conversation uh, that we've had. Uh, we know uh, in terms of uh, Portugal's connection to Jewish history, uh, really, we talked about the Golden Age, uh, and then we talked about the, the tragic period uh, that followed, the expulsion and what followed. Now, uh, a revival, a renewed interest uh, by Portuguese in their Jewish history in the country. Um, we uh, look forward to, to visiting the Oporto Museum, the Lisbon Museum, the Lisbon Museum of Jewish History, um, uh, and, and all of that, uh, because it's extremely important uh, for both peoples uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to really understand uh, each other better. So we thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Best of luck in the remainder of the Portuguese presidency. Thank you very much, Dan. Let me tell you that you started by saying that 20% uh, of the Portuguese population, um, well, might have uh, Jewish. I think that it's, it's more than that, I would say. I would say. I would be very curious if we had, you know, a national program to just to trace our uh, DNA in Portugal. I think, <laughs> uh, I would say almost 100% of us have as a drop of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish blood. Uh, and uh, we are very, very proud of our Jewish heritage in Portugal. And let me tell you something. One of the uh, most positive developments in the relations between Portugal and the United States, for all its implications, for, during the period I've been ambassador to the United States, is the number of American tourists visiting Portugal. It came from 380,000 when I arrived to 1,200,000 last year, so before the pandemic. And many of them are of Jewish origin or are just uh, uh, Jewish, and they go to Portugal exactly to see, to visit, to get in touch with these traces of uh, our Jewish, Jewish uh, history. Uh, so um, it's, a, uh, it's, been, it's been a very good element in getting Portugal and the United States closer. Well, we really appreciate that. I know that there are air links now also between Israel and Portugal. So uh, this is uh, really, uh, these are developments that we, that we certainly do welcome. Mr. Ambassador, thank you again uh, thank you. for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming virtual programs. A recording of this conversation will be available on demand on the B'nai B'rith International YouTube channel shortly. I also want to thank all of you for joining us, and I hope that you'll come back for future discussions. Until then, for B'nai B'rith, I'm Dan Mariashin. Take care, everyone, and continue to be well.